Hello kiddos and welcome back to yet another retro channel. As you might have guessed from my attire, I actually plan to work on a VIC-20 today. In fact, this VIC-20 right here. However, this machine has thrown me for a bit of a loop, as a lot of these machines have been doing. I've been trying for quite a while to get a VIC-20 on the channel to repair, and I've purchased several that were either untested or for parts of repair, only to find that they just work. Um, these machines are, are frankly too reliable. The machine you see before you, I purchased from the same gentleman that I purchased a Commodore PET 2001-32N. Um, now that PET is in really sad shape. There's a lot of corrosion on the case, it's filthy. And uh, the only time I've tried to power it up, the um, CRT had no vertical deflection. There was only a, a single line across the center of the screen. So that machine was in disrepair. And this, these machines were coming from his, his father's estate. He unfortunately passed away. And his father was a retro computer guy and repaired these things. So... Uh, when he told me he also had this VIC-20, I took a look at it. It is yellowed almost beyond belief, almost the most yellowed computer I've ever had in my personal possession. It's filthy, needs a lot of cleaning. Now, it did come with the box, the power supply, even the RF modulator, and the original styrofoam, or at least most of it. Um, however, in the condition it was in, I just made the assumption, as one would, that it was going to be a non-functional machine. And it sat around here for a while waiting for me to get around to uh, to wanting to try to do a VIC-20. But uh, last night when I took it out, plugged it in, turned it on, it just worked. Don't! I've commented to some folks recently that that's one of my pet peeves when you buy, you go out of your way to buy a machine that you think is not working and uh, Turns out it just works. That can be a bit frustrating. So all it needs, it, like I said, it needs a clean. Um, it did need an adjustment on one of the video pots. Um, the signal was very weak, so I just had to, uh, the compass signal was very weak. It might have worked just fine over the RF modulator. I didn't try that. Um, but I wanted to boost the composite signal, so I went ahead and tweaked that uh, little potentiometer and got a perfect video signal out of it. I plugged in my uh, Penultimate Plus cartridge and ran the Tineless software dead test. All the RAM passed, the ROMs passed, uh, so I went ahead and hooked up my VIC-20 diagnostic harness and the diagnostic cartridge and ran the the stock VIC-20 diagnostics, and everything passed with flying colors. So this machine doesn't need repaired. Kind of leaves me at a loose end for today's video. I'm not sure what I'm going to do for you. Uh, we'll take a look and see what we've got laying around that we can work on. Of course, I do have plenty of machines here to work on. I've got I've got a tote full of Commodore 64s that I was holding off for uh, this year's repair -a -thon. There's 10 of them. So I might do one of those. I need to program my, um, I forget what this thing is called. I need to set up some test tools um, that I bought for quite a while ago and never got around to uh, completing and getting working. I also have a stack of uh, Sid Kick Pico boards that I need to assemble one or two of. I'd like to do a video coming up uh, in the near future about the uh, comparison of the various uh, Sid replacements. But to do that, I need to order a few. I need to get a back Sid. I need to get. I've got arm Sids. I need to get a few of the others so I can run a head-to-head -head comparison uh, and see which one performs the, the best, in my personal opinion. That's that's always a personal opinion thing. Um, 
I've always been of the opinion that the 6581 R4 AR sounded the best. And up till now, I've thought that the Armstead was the closest replacement for that. But we'll see what the Sid Kick Pico can do and um, you know, put it head to get head against those and, and some others. I've got TRS-80 color computers that I can work on. I've got, well, of course, there's the um, the PET that I mentioned. I've also got a TRS-80 Model 4P that needs work. I do have some IBMs. I have a 5150 that needs work. A 5160 that's almost in working condition probably needs a little bit more. And then I've got a 5162 that I've never even tested. So there is, uh, there's plenty on the... Uh, project queue to work on for you guys. I'm just not sure which one I'm going to do. You'll also note a slight difference in the sound quality right now. Um, if you've watched my last video, part two of the ti 99 a repair, you'll have heard horrible audio. And that seems to be down to the lav mic, the lapel mic that I was using. For some reason, all of a sudden that has stopped working the way it used to. It, it, it worked for a long time and, and did decent with the audio, but it's just horrible now. So I have ordered a new mic setup, but it hasn't arrived yet. What you're hearing today is audio being recorded through the overhead camera that I use, which is just a webcam. It's a, uh, a Logitech Brio webcam. I don't have, uh, like a lot of the YouTubers, I don't have fancy DSLR cameras hanging all around my room. Uh, recording this stuff. I record it through webcam to OBS. Um, but I went ahead and set up the audio from that. Temporarily at least, that's what I'm going to be using until the new mic setup comes in and I get it dialed in. So hopefully the sound will be a little better today. So all that being said, stick around and we'll see what I get up to. Well, it's a couple of days later, mostly because yesterday was Easter Sunday. Uh, for those of you who celebrate those holidays, uh, I hope you had a great Easter. For everyone else, I hope you had a great weekend. And I've had some time to think about what I want to do for you in this video. And what I've come up with is something a bit different from what I normally do. Normally, I would have a particular computer out here that I'd be working on. But today, I was going to call this video a day in the life. But that's not quite appropriate as I normally wouldn't do all this stuff in one day. So what I've decided to call it is all the small things. And what you're going to see is a little bit of the stuff that goes on behind the scenes, off camera, that I normally have to do to keep the channel running, to keep, to keep up with my uh, retro repairing efforts. And it'll give you a little glimpse into what goes on behind the scenes. So we're going to do several projects. You can get an idea of what some of what those might be from the thumbnail. But um, that's where we're headed with this. So stick around and we'll see what we can get up to. The first thing we're going to look at today falls into the category of equipment maintenance. What we have here is my Samsung Galaxy Tab S3 that I, I've had for several years and I've used for several purposes over that time. Uh, most recently, it's been living its life as a Stream Deck. And for those of you who might not know what a Stream Deck is, it's a physical device usually that's sold by Elgato. Uh, there may be some knockoffs that run Elgato's Stream Deck software that's sort of a remote control for your computer. It can control lots of things, but a lot of people use it to control their streaming or recording setup, and that's what I've been doing with it. I normally keep it in this leather case, which is in pretty sad shape, but it does protect the tablet and also provides a way to kickstand it up so that I can set it up in whatever configuration I want. But recently I took it, I took the tablet out of the case and I found, forget why, I think I was having some kind of problem with it, but uh, what I found was that the battery packs, and I don't know if you'll be able to see this on camera, they're bulging quite badly. They were bulging badly enough that they actually pushed 
the back plate off. So the back plate was disconnected and the batteries were bulged. So I have ordered a replacement battery pack, which you see right here, and we're going to go about replacing it today. Now, it's actually, I've watched a video on this, it's pretty easy to do, so it shouldn't take me long to make this change. Now, the first step is we need to uh, disconnect some ribbon connectors. So we have this one here and this one here, which are latching connectors. So we just need to pull the tape off, that's covering the connector. Set that aside for reuse later. And off of this one, again, set it aside for later. Uh -uh. These, like I said, are latching clips, so we need to put them up, put the latches up. This is that one. Pull that ribbon cable out. And then this one latches from the back. So I'm going to pop that up. And that ribbon cable should come free now. There you go. And then there are two connectors under this piece of plastic, and you just have to pry this piece of plastic up so that you can get underneath and disconnect those ribbons. And they're just push-on connectors, so they should be easier. There. And there. Okay. Now that the ribbons are disconnected, we need to unscrew the five screws holding the battery pack in place. lose any of these five little screws, so be careful with them. Okay, and now we're going to lift the old battery pack out. Like so, and we can probably see a little better how much that bulge now. So we'll have to dispose of this properly. And we bring in the new battery pack. Make sure it goes properly under the three ribbons that are connected. And the fourth ribbon is for the battery pack itself. And reinstall the Little screws. All right, now we reattach the ribbon cable. I'm going to start with the two at the top here under the plastic. batteries in place. The back plate should fit back on. And let's see if we can turn it on. Yep. Okay. We're charging. So that's one task finished. Next task that we have to look at is this is a package that I just received um, like yesterday, or no, uh, Saturday. It is two 6510 CPUs that I ordered. I've got a, I think I mentioned earlier in the video, I've got an upcoming C64 Reparathon and 
although CPUs are not the most common thing to go bad, they do occasionally. So I ordered a couple uh, from on eBay. Uh, these actually came from Hungary. So I want to open them up on camera here and test them in the ZIF 64. So you grab that. Here is the ZIF 64. You've seen this before if you watch my channel. So we will hook up video and my safe bench power supply, 64 power supply. And I got my monitor and switch over to output here so you can see what's going on. Let's make sure first that the ZIF 64 is still working. And it is. Uh, there you go. Pops up on the screen a little after it comes up on my screen here. Um, so I saw it before you did, but it's still working. So what we're going to do now is we're going to open these up on camera. And there are our two 6510 CPUs. And we will test them one at a time in the ZIF machine and see if they work. It's a desolder, so it's been pulled from another machine. But the pins look in pretty good shape and they're not bent out of alignment. They are short, so it'll be interesting to see if the ZIF socket can hold it. It does feel like it's in there. And let's see if it works. I'll try not to jump the gun on you this time. Wait for it to show up on the video capture. And we have one working CPU. That's good. We'll mark that one. Pull it out. Back under the anti static foam. Grab the other one, and again, it is a pull, so it's been desoldered from a board, and the pins are a bit short. So, pop that in there, secure, and give it a test. And look at that, we actually got two good working 6510 CPUs from a foreign seller. It's nice after the debacle we had with the TMS 9900 from a US seller that uh, we recently saw in the TI 99 video. Now, I have ordered two more TMS 9900s one from a U.S. seller and one from China. The one from the U.S. seller uh, arrived yesterday, yes, believe or no, arrived today. So I've got one of them. The one from China take up to another week longer. Um, so it'll be a while before I get back to the TI-99. But hopefully one of those two CPUs will work. So that's another task completed. We have two good working 6510s. Set the zip board aside for now. We'll probably see it later in the video, but for the moment, we don't need it. Uh, the next thing I'm going to do is on the TI 99 that we've been working on. This is the one with the potentially dead CPU. After the last video, I did go ahead and pull out those milled pin uh, headers that I had uh, inserted in here for the CPU, and I have since received the 64 pin dual wipe socket so i want to fit this instead of those pin headers because this will be easier to get cpus in and out of so i am going to heat up my soldering iron let's get this fitted in place now this doesn't have a notch as such but it does have an edge here that it doesn't have on this side so this is going to be the notch side in the 
TI-994A, the notch goes to the left. So we'll slip that in there. And our blue tack. Get this ready to solder. Okay, we're up the temperature on the solder iron. I'm gonna grab the solder and a little flux. We'll start with the two corner pins. And then with our fingers hold it in place and make sure that we're flush to the to the circuit board. Move a little bit. And so did that one. So now we're flush, we can go ahead and solder the rest of the pins. Okay, that looks to be all in place nicely. So that's ready for the next video when we have the CPUs to test. The next thing I want to do is build up the programmer for the Romulator 6502. Uh, what this is, is a little board that allows you to replace the RAM and ROM on a 6502 based machine, such as the VIC-20, the Apple II, and several other machines so that you can diagnose problems with RAM and ROM uh, much easier. This was originally designed to be programmed via a Raspberry Pi 3, but when I made an attempt to do that, unfortunately it seems that the libraries have moved on in the Raspberry Pi operating system and uh, they would I could no longer get the uh, programming code to compile. So I went ahead and purchased Bitfixer. Michael Hill, who designed this, has uh, created this standalone programmer that you can use in place of the Raspberry Pi. And I bought a kit and I need to build it up. So that's what we're going to do now. that upside down so I'm gonna to have to undo it all Okay, <laughs> now I just need to learn how to program it. Okay, so that was actually more of a convoluted process than I was expecting. So I'm not going to show it in this video. I think I will probably make a standalone video to show how to go through the process of um, programming this little D1 mini board and then programming the Romulator. It would make this video way too long. So we'll skip over that for now and I'll just tell you that I did get this 
working and I used it to program the Romulator with uh, just a few uh, profiles for the VIC-20 and we're going to use the VIC-20 that as I said just worked to give a, dem a quick demonstration that it does actually operate. So to let you see that the VIC-20 is in a working state here it is, and there you see the VIC-20 working with the uh, stock configuration with the 6502 in place. Now, to use the Romulator, we remove the 6502, okay, and then we put it in the Romulator, and make sure you follow, there's a little uh, silk screen marking telling you where the notch goes. So the notch goes to that end. You want to be careful if you're, uh, you're probably using the little sacrificial uh, socket on the bottom because the Romulator itself uses the milled pin headers and they don't go well into these types of sockets. So you use a sacrificial socket in the middle and then you Put the Romulator into the VIC-20 with the chip in the same orientation that it was originally. So the notch for the CPU is on this side, so the notch is here. And then we fit it into the socket carefully. I did run into some problems with bending pins and it didn't like that during the process. So there we are with the CPU in the Romulator and the Romulator in the VIC-20. And I have a profile set up for a full pass-through. So the entire memory space is simply passed through. The ROMs and the RAMs will be, that it'll be using are the ROMs and RAMs that are on the board. So it should come up just like it did before. And there we go. So now I have several other profiles on here. Some replace the ROMs, some, some, well, here's, here's one that, replaces everything I believe and it actually gives you your you're, you're able with this to actually use um, RAM on the Romulator itself to extend the RAM on a computer like the VIC-20 so in this case we will see the VIC-20 as if it had all RAM installed or have it had a, a RAM expander cartridge now it will take slightly longer to boot this time because the computer does figure out how much RAM it has, and that takes a little longer when it has more. So here we go. And there we go. You can see that it has replaced and extended the RAM to the full size that it can be, 28159 bytes free. So the Romulator is working. And I can use that. I can, you know, if I want to work on uh, an Apple an Apple II Plus, for instance, I can put profiles into it, program them in for the Apple. Um, I can put in different profiles for the uh, VIC-20 here. I could edit the ROM files and, for instance, get it to say something other than CBM Basic V2 uh, if I wanted to, or edit the ROM files in, in whatever way I want. As long as those ROM files are loaded in here, it, it can replace the ROMs. And then if I wanted to uh, use the debug functions of the Romulator, which it allows you to halt the CPU, it allows you to take a snapshot of memory, and it allows you to then re and upload a, uh, the memory back to the machine. So it, it has a lot of, uh, well, it has some debug functions. The way you would do that, you would, you would use the debug or the program debug board and fit it onto the programming pins on the Romulator and then it would as you'll see here it will blink 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 and it should go steady blue and what that means is that it has opened it is connected to my Wi-Fi network and through that I can go to the programming and debug interface which is a simple web page I'll show that in greater detail in the standalone video that I create. So 
for now, know that this Romulator is now working fully functional. Okay, the next thing I'm going to do is try to build up one of the new Sid Kick Picos. Uh, the first step in doing that is making sure that I have all the parts. So I'm going to go through the interactive bomb, which was provided by the developer, and make sure I have all the parts. So let's see what we've got. This is the 100 nanofarad capacitors. Now, I may have made a mistake here, but I don't think it'll be an issue. Um, I actually purchased tantalum capacitors, uh, which are polarized, and the uh, the bomb doesn't call for tantalums, so I should have gotten uh, a different type of capacitor, but we'll see if this works. If not, I'll reorder and, and uh, replace the capacitors on this one and any future ones with the proper, with the proper ones. But the capac the 100, 100 nanofarad capacitors are line one, so we'll check them off as sourced. The second component I have here is uh, the 1N4148 diodes. That is line 5. We have those. The next part is uh, the 1.8K resistor, and that's line 4. Then we have a 10K resistor, that is line 3. Next, 470 ohm resistor, that's line 2. And finally, the 74 CBTD3861, uh, that's the little bus switch ICs, and that is line six. There's two of those on the board. So we have the parts. Um, I've also collected here um, the pin headers that we'll be needing. So I've, I've cut those to the right sizes, and they're ready to go. And we also have the pin headers for the uh, Pi Pico. So we'll do those later. And now we are ready, in theory, to begin soldering these parts in. So we get the microscope. We're gonna start with the smallest parts, which would be the diodes. But first thing we're going to do, is we're going to give our board a little clean, some IPA on a swab. I'll show you attaching one of each uh, type of part. The resistors, capacitors, and diodes are all 0805s, so the process for soldering them will be the same for all. And uh, I'll just show you one, and then I'll zip through the rest. And then I'll show you the process of soldering one of the two ICs and zip through the second one. So, what do we have first? First, we have the 470 ohm resistors, and I am going to need two of those. Because I'm going to apply a tiny amount of flux. Again, the two 470s go here. So I'm going to apply a little flux to one pad. And then I'm going to apply solder to that pad. And using the tweezers, I will get the little resistor, reheat the solder. and then solder the other side. And 
and then touch it up. And I'll do the same thing for the other resistor. Now, the trickier part is the little ICs. What we're going to do here is we're going to tack down one corner. and use that to position the chip and then we will figure out where pin one is it looks like this little mark here is the pin one marker. So, which pin is pin one on the IC? Okay. So, that pin is pin one. And that pin has the pin one marker, so this is the orientation we want for this IC. No, I don't think I got that. Now I'm going to try something called a drag soldering. Oh, we're not quite in orientation alignment yet, are we? Yeah. And we'll try. To get that a little better. Aligned.
Now we'll try the drag solder. Some solder on the tip. And then we will simply drag along. I don't think so. I'm doing this without flux. That's probably part of the problem. So let's get some flux in here. Well, I'm sorry to say a very amateurish attempt at SMD soldering. I'm not proud of myself at all here. But we'll see if it works. Not the best SMD soldering I've ever seen, but not the worst. I think it might actually work. Just clean up our mess here. Okay, now for the part that I'm actually semi-decent at soldering in pen headers do this a lot um, i'm using a 40 pin dip socket to align the headers that will go into the sid socket and i'm going to solder those on the top of the board started with pins on the opposing corners so that i could make sure everything is flush to the board by reheating. Okay. Now I'm going to apply some flux and solder the rest of the pins. Then I need to solder in the there's or the Pi Pico. I have put the firmware on the Raspberry Pi Pico and it's time to give this a test and see if anything explodes. So I'm going to grab our old friend the Zip64 
And as usual, we'll give it a test to make sure that it's working. And it is. Okay, we've got the ZIF64 hooked up and we have the Easy Flash cartridge. And I'm just going to make sure this thing is still running. And we're going to test the audio and hear what an, an, a real original 6581 SID sounds like. So we can compare. And of course, we're going to use the song that everybody is most familiar with. Thank you, Adrian. Okay, so let's pop out our SID. And pop in our SID Kick Pico. And if I did everything right, we should boot up and be able to get sound. If I did things wrong, well, things could explode. So. Keep your eye on, on the uh, birdie here. Let's see what happens. Well, the machine's working. Let's see if we get any sound. there you go. It works. I would not say that I find it as satisfying a sound as the original SID. I think uh, the original SID had some better low end, but we're going to do a comparison video upcoming uh, where I compare original SIDs, uh, R4ARs, um, ARM SIDs, the SID Kick Pico, uh, the uh, Swin SID, back SID and a few others. But for now, that's all for the SID Kick Pico. Okay, a little piece of additional information. Um, I didn't realize the default for this was 8580 mode, so I went into the configuration and modified it so that it's now in 6581 mode, and it actually sounds a little better.
So it's pretty close to uh, the original SID, and I think it's pretty close to an ARM SID. Again, we'll be doing a comparison video coming up in the near future, so keep an eye out for that. And on to the next thing. Okay, the next project is a Tippy, Tippy 32K. This is an expansion for the TI-994A that provides a 32K memory expansion, hard disk and floppy disk emulation, and Wi-Fi connectivity. So, in essence, this replaces, if you're familiar with the peripheral expansion system or peripheral expansion box, often called a PEB, the big, massive, heavy uh, box that you attach to your TI-99 that you can put floppy drives, uh, an RS-232 card, 32K memory expansion card into to expand the functionality of your TI-99. That's all been boiled down into this card. Now, there are other PEB replacements such as the Nano PEB, but I've decided to go with a Tippy. So this is actually uh, already built up. It comes built up. But what we need to do, uh, this uses a Raspberry Pi, in this case, a Raspberry Pi 0W. So we need to add a few things to the Pi to make this work with the Tippy. Um, I'm going to add a heat sink, but that's not a functional uh, thing. That's just protection to, to keep it from boiling over. Uh, we need to add some socket headers because these will plug into this port on the tippy. Um, we have some other socket headers. These are pretty much unnecessary unless I wanted to reprogram the tippy board itself. Uh, these are these go into the JTAG headers on the Pi and then these will be for a power an internal power connection to allow me to connect the Raspberry Pi power to the tippy. Uh, and then of course we have a micro SD card that we need to program to plug into the Raspberry Pi. So we're going to get started with this by putting in the pin headers.
Okay, now all I have left to do is program the micro SD card. To flash the SD card, we need a program called Etcher. Okay, and then we need to put our SD card into the computer. Download the installation file. Now, use the Etcher program to write the file to the micro SD card. Once the flashing is completed, the Etcher will validate that the flash was correct. And now we're ready to go ahead and assemble the tippy. So, the Raspberry Pi which now has these headers down here, plugs into this connector. Actually, let's do something else first. Um, I'm going to power the Pi internally from the tippy. So I need to connect the five volt pin here to one of these two header pins that we soldered in, and then put the tippy in place. And we load the SD card. And the tippy is now ready to go. Now, this is designed to fit inside a speech synthesizer case. Um, I have this one here. I have two. I have a, a a fully complete and working one that I have connected to uh, my TI downstairs with the TMS digitizer in it. And then I have this one that's missing the, the little door that's supposed to fit here. I could use this one, but I think what I'm actually going to do is uh, 3D print one. There is a 3D model online available that you can print one of these shells uh, to fit your tippy in. I may use this one temporarily just to show you how it works, how it fits in, but uh, I will eventually print a more complete case, uh, one that's not in such sad shape. So my tippy should now be ready to go. Now you can uh, you can use these in conjunction with other expansion port cards. So uh, let's say for instance, and I do have the other speech synthesizers. So I would plug this into the expansion port in the TI-99 and then plug the second expansion port device, the in this case, the speech synthesizer in on this side through this port. And that should be it. Um, but I'm going to leave the demonstration to a future video. So, that's going to be it for this video. So, if you enjoyed our little look behind the scenes of what goes on to keep the channel running, go ahead and give me a like and a thumbs up. And if you have comments, leave me a comment below. I always love engaging with you folks in the comments. Of course, you can also engage with me on either my YouTube group or my Discord channel. I'm also in several other Discord channels, so you might find me several other places around. Share the video out uh, to as many people as you can. That definitely helps the channel. And uh, if you haven't already, please subscribe to the channel. That definitely helps out. And if you want to be more supportive, there are a few ways that you can do that. You can become a patron through Patreon. You can also donate through Ko-Fi. Or you can join as a channel member using the link somewhere down here. 
that's always appreciated. And for those of you who are already supporting me, thank you very much. I think that's about it. So, everybody, be safe and well. Have a great week. And we'll catch you next time on yet another Retro Channel. Talk to you later. Bye. Nope, we're not done yet. You're getting a bonus project because I had forgotten about this one. So it wasn't in the thumbnail and it wasn't in the original plan. But we're going to go ahead and get this one done today too. Uh, what we've got here is a board uh, designed and provided to me by a friend of mine, Rudy, from Rudy's Retro Intel. I've mentioned before that I have a PET 2001-32N coming up on the channel. And to help me fix that, one of the things I wanted was the Romulator, which is why I did that project. And another thing is Rudy's little pet companion board. Now what this is, is a board that plugs in to the um, user port on the pet and allows you to get out both composite video and um, a signal that's compatible with the RGB to HDMI. So we can use this to uh, work on the motherboard without needing to have the monitor working on the pet. Uh, my monitor, I think I've mentioned uh, right now, has the very least of its problems is that it has no vertical deflection. It just has a single line across the middle of the screen. So we need to build up this little board so that we can work on the motherboard of the pet and then work on fixing the monitor. So this is the kit that Rudy sent me. And we're going to look at getting this thing put together. Okay, looks like it's actually pretty straightforward. Everything is labeled on the silk screen on the top of the board, and everything is nicely labeled. So all I have to do is actually start getting to it. So we will start with, actually we'll start with the frame to hold things in place, hold the board in place while I work. building it upside down. I assumed the side with most of the writing on it was uh, was the top. Yep. Upside down. Got to pull everything back out again. Okay. So, we got everything back in the right order. Now two 100k pots, or resistors, I should say. A 10k trim pot, which goes here. And some headers. Uh, there's a jumper that goes with those headers. And the IC sockets. And the port for the RGB to HDMI. And we can start soldering all that in once we get our iron up to temperature. In the meantime, we can add flux. little clean. All right, looking good so far. Now, move to some of the larger components. 
we don't need the frame anymore. <coughs> so we have the two ports. Okay, now we need to put the cartridge connector on, and to do that, we're going to need to tighten up those pins. So we just use the desk, give them a bend each way. Nope, not good enough yet. Okay, now we slide the board in between them carefully. Don't want to bend any of them. And then we line up the pins with the pads. Give us a little tweak so that it's straight. I make sure the pads on both sides and the pins are lined up. I'm going to tack one pin. I think right about in the middle. And then I'm going to use that. Oh, oop. Straighten it. Pretty well lined up, so let's get a pad on the other side. I want to make sure these are good, strong connections because this is going to be one of the stress points for uh, attaching and detaching it from the pet. We don't want these connections breaking. So we want good, strong, solid solder joints. Okay. This is the 4011. And that's the 4011. Good, no bent pins. And this is the 4066. Okay. Now, this little board goes into the tape port to get five volts. So we need to attach this card edge header to this one. And it says right here on the board, connect to tape port that way. So this goes on this side. Again, we're just going to bend the pins with the cartridge connector in. 
and then slide the board in. See that those are getting a good pinch, so that's nice. And then we'll again tack just one and then use that to align the board straight. And one last thing, these two need to be connected together with this little piece of wire. It's a marker, on, uh, marker in the silk screen for where the 5 volt DC gets picked up. It gets picked up right here. There we go. And then goes right here on this board. And that's it, one pet companion. Now we won't be able to test this until I get the pet out. Uh, so we'll just leave this as is for now. And we are actually done this time. So thank you for watching. See you in the next one, bye.